All right. Um, all right. I let me see. I'm gonna try. Okay. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Uh, evening, everybody. Welcome back to the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Uh, I'm MC Owens, and this is the Dharma Doors, our Sunday night sutra study class. Uh, tonight's a very special night. Today is a very special day, of course, June 28th. Um, uh, but tonight's a very special night uh, because we're going to, well, we're going to be reading mainly, or I'm going to be reading mainly from a, it's not a sutra. I'm going to be mainly reading from something called the Therigatha. And the Therigatha is a collection of gathas, a collection of poems, a collection of verses from the fairies. Now the fairies are, they're not the theras, right? The elders, the monks, they're actually the elder nuns. And so Therigatha are the verses or the songs even, the gathas of the nuns. Uh, the, the elder nuns though, because these are thera fairies, right? Um, and so there is a book that I'm gonna be reading from primarily, which is this book here. Um, the First Free Women. And this is a translation, a newer translation of this kind of older Pali text, the Therigatha. And I highly recommend this, what was this a Shambhala, this Shambhala edition uh, that I'm gonna be reading from tonight. Um, and I have, I sort of have a very interesting story about how we came to discuss Sakha. So tonight it's sort of like, yeah, I'm reading from this collection of poems from the nuns, but this is the Dharma doors. We're studying sutras. And so I'm going to connect this to the Sukha Sutta. So this is a sutra or a sutta that's from the Samyutta Nikaya, the connected discourses of the Buddha. And very, you know, serendipitously, right, uh, auspiciously even, when months and months and months and months and months ago, when I started, even before the Vimalakirti excursion experience, when I started priming us for that excursion to Vimalakirti and everything that's happened since then, I began with a very tiny sutta, from this same very, some, this Samyutta Nikaya collection. And I started with a tiny sutta called the Sudatta Sutra. And that's actually the sutra about Anathapindika, the great donor, yada, yada. What was really interesting is that I was, you know, I spent a whole night on that sutra. And the very next sutra, sutta, in this collection is called the Sukha Sutta. And there's actually two sutras by that name in this collection. And I was really struck by this, sut this sutta. And again, I was preparing for some other class, but I read this sutta. And so I'm just gonna start uh, the class tonight with this beautiful sutta. Uh, again, it's from the Samyutta Nikaya, sutra number 10, part nine. And I read this sutta and it says, thus have I heard, on one occasion, the blessed one was dwelling at Rajgriha in the bamboo grove in the squirrel sanctuary. Now on that occasion, the bhikkhuni, the nun, Sikha, surrounded by a large assembly was teaching the Dharma. Then, a yaksha, a tree spirit, who had full confidence in the bhikkhuni sikha, went from street to street and from square to square in Rajgriha. And on that occasion, the yaksha, the tree spirit, recited these verses. Indeed, these gathas. What has happened to these people in Rajgriha? They sleep as if they have been drinking mead. 
why don't they attend on Sukkah as she teaches the deathless state? But the wise, as it were, drink it up. The Dharma, irresistible, ambrosial, nutritious, as travelers drink a cloud. That's the sutta, by the way. That's it. And I read that and I was just like, who is Sukkha? Who, what is going on here? Squirrel sanctuary? A uh, yaksha tree spirit is wandering the streets of Rajgriha saying like, what's, what's everybody's problem? Don't they hear Sukkha preaching the Dharma? So th this, this sutta about the nun preaching the Dharma, something you don't read and hear a lot about, I, it really struck me as very interesting. And it kind of just stayed with me. Totally just, you know, like, oh, like, I, I want to research this squirrel sanctuary. I want to find out more about Sika. And then um, a week ago or so, my love, whose birthday it is, came home with this book, The First Free Women, this uh, translation of the Therigatha. I've heard of the Therigatha, but I honestly had not really read it. I'm, I'm a sutra head, you know, so I read a lot of sutras. And when she first brought home the book, I was like, oh, and I, you know, basically literally turned to the page, which is the poem of Sukkha. And I was like, Sukkha, that's the nun, that's the nun from Squirrel Sanctuary. And what I want to convey to you is this like deep, um, well, I want to, you know, I'm going to read you these poems of these beautiful nuns, but you know, in all of these beautiful sutras that we've been reading, especially the Mahayana ones, the Mahayana ones that we've been reading lately, you know, we hear about Shariputra, we hear about Ananda, we hear about these characters, but we're kind of aware that within the, certainly within the Mahayana tradition, they're, they're allegorical figures. Shariputra represents something, and I, I don't really know Shariputra, per se. I kind of understand the mythological archetypal figure that is Shariputra. But with these, the, these nuns, this, in particular the Sukha, what struck me when I found her poem amongst this collection, when I was already curious about who this nun was, there, there again, there was just this deep resonance of the, I don't want to say like historical reality of this person because I, you know, I'm not really hung up on, you know, uh, glorifying history in that way. But there was something that happened where I was like, wow, this was a real person, like a really, really, really real person. And, and something has happened in 2020 <laughs> that her, her voice has come crying out of the wilderness and and i feel really fortunate tonight to be able to be the sort of the the spokesperson for sukha in that way so i just want to preface with you how did we come to do this tonight well it started with that funny little sutra about sukha and then stumbling upon this beautiful collection of verses uh, i believe there's 73 little poems in in this collection it's been translated several times into English. Again, I highly recommend this Shambhala one. It's just beautifully rendered. This one, which I believe is a, a Harvard University Press, the only reason why I would recommend this one is because it has actually the Pali, the Pali, or at least the transliterated and Romanized you know, letters, the Pali on one side. So it's a great study edition if you're really interested in this. So. That's the first Sukha Sutra, and I'm going to read her other sutta in a moment. But I want to slowly start to transition to these beautiful poems. Um, I kind of want to really take it easy tonight. These are very, very beautiful poems. I want to do, try to do my best, you know, to, to bring them to life in that way. Um, the, the Dharma's heavy in these. I'm not going to, you know. It's, it's, these are for real poems. And so we will have things to talk about, but again, I kind of want to make it more about the reciting of these verses, um, 
by the way, the word Gatha, this is an you know, old Sanskrit term for a song or a verse. Um, it's a very particular style. And within the Buddhist community, you should know that Gathas and, and most suttas are actually written in the poetic form of Gathas, by the way. Gathas are, are understood to be anapana, anapanasati, that their, their very uh, meter is supposed to sync up with the inhalation, exhalation. And so while, while you're reading Gathas, they are a meditation. These are, of course, translated, so we don't have the same meter as in the Pali, but we're going to do our best. Um, uh, at any point, of course, stop me, you know, if I've glossed over anything, skipped over anything, any questions. But I'm going to start with Sakha's um, uh, Gatha, with her song. And her name, all of these, uh, all of these nuns, of course, like all monastics, have, have these beautiful names. You know, and of course, you should know, if you don't know, you should know that part of what we're talking about tonight is uh, renunciation. You know, we're talking about nuns. So we're talking about some very bold women in the past who have, who have renounced, who have gone forth, as it's called, left home. We're going to hear some of those ideas uh, echoed in these, in these poems, I, the ideas of leaving home, renouncing, and things like that. And so when you do that, well, part of it, of course, is shaving your head. We'll hear, hear about that. But another part of it, of course, is giving up your, your name, your family name, because you're kind of severing all ties with your family. But you also give up your, your personal name. And yeah, there's some deep stuff going on there with ego loss and, you know, all of that. But what you get then is this Dharma name. This is part of the process still today. If you go renounce, you kind of give up your, your government name, so to speak, and you take on a Dharma name. And so this is Sikha. And I'm not the best at Sanskrit and Pali pronunciation. I'm, I'm getting better. But as I understand it, it, the emphasis is on the second syllable. That's the line over the A. So it's Sikha, not Sikha. Because she's no sucka. She is no sucka, I'm going to tell you. So sakha means, means bright. It can also mean a star, but there's another word for star. This sort of means brilliant, lustrous, bright. And there's, there's an interesting kind of... I, I mean, this gets weird, you know, where sakha is Sika. Like this woman, this nun Sika is, is bright. She's brilliant. She is said to have glowed in the face. But there's a little bit more to that idea of, of, of shining, of brilliance. So this is her Gatha. This, I'm going to start with this one tonight. Uh, this is the, and the, by the way, all the Gathas are named the, the name of the nun. So this is Sukha. It wasn't so long ago that all the men in town knew my name. Now that I wear a shaved head and the double robe, they don't pay me any attention. They just lie around drinking wine all day. Why tie yourself to a bottle when the next watering hole is far ahead and the last watering hole is far behind? I could teach you how to drink what falls from the sky. Look at me. Even on the darkest night, I could show you where to find enough light to make your way back home. That's it. So there's something going on, of course, with the... Um, the initial uh, sutta I read. This is, uh, by the way, this yaksha lived, um, these yakshas I've written up here, by the way, these are the eight heavenly beings. I might get into them. Yakshas are one of the eight heavenly beings. Yakshas are like 
sprites, spirits. I don't really know what English word to use for these ideas or these things, but there was a tree or a tree spirit. There was a yaksha. There was a yaksha that lived in Squirrel Sanctuary where Saka lived. And there was this yaksha tree spirit that they called Devata. Devata is like a deva. It's the feminine form of, of deva, right? This is the feminine. And what's interesting about this yaksha then is that it's a female tree spirit. And this tr female tree spirit became devoted to Saka. It's real, and, and we don't know, like, um, supposedly this tree, by the way, is like um, in, in the Lord of the Rings, the Ents, like this tree can walk around, like wander the streets of Rajgriha and try to get everybody to come listen to Sika. And what I wanted to point out about that original sutta is that the Yaksha, the Yaksha's poem is what's happened to these people of Rajgriha? They sleep as if they've been drinking mead. Why don't they attend to Sika as she teaches the deathless state, as she teaches the Dharma, right? And then her poem is this thing about why tie yourself to a bottle when the next watering hole is so far behind and the next one is so far ahead, right? I could teach you how to drink what falls from the sky. So there's something, you know, maybe she was a barmaid it's it's kind of my suspicion a lot of the nuns their their poems speak of their occupation before they were nun whether they were a mother whether they were a prostitute whether they were this whether they were that the poems speak a lot about their life before they renounced and so my suspicion is is that maybe she was a barmaid or something to that effect and where she had a lot of interactions with with drunkards in that way and so she's a very interesting sort of patron nun for, you know, for recovery in that way. I mean, this is sort of an interesting nun that I just wanted to spend a, a, a moment on. Yeah. Um, by the way, this idea, the last part of her poem, even on the darkest night, I could show you where to find enough light to make your way back home. There, I, I could be here all night actually like taking that apart. But a lot of these poems, and I'm going to read a few more, and they speak about, and indeed the Dharma in general, speaks a lot about in a certain internal illumination, a certain internal luminosity, actually, that well, without getting too out there and too weird about it, that luminosity is said to be able to go outward. M meaning like if it's a very dark night, but you are very, very, very wise, <laughs> you have these sort of like illuminating sunshine eyes. There's a great Chinese expression that comes out of a Buddhist sutra that basically reads illuminating eyes of sunshine. <laughs> And they are speaking about this sort of luminous state that is indeed Sika, this, this bright. So that's what, that's her poem. Uh, I'm going to shift over to Soma, I think. I have an, a weird uh, uh, order that I'm probably going to jump around based on how I'm feeling. But I'm going to jump to Soma. So this is another nun given the beautiful name happiness soma and her poem reads he said how could a woman who knows no more than how to cook clean and make babies possibly reach the farther shore nirvana on the way to which so many good men have drowned or turned back I said, the mind is neither male nor female. When directed toward the arising and passing away of all things, it easily penetrates 
this mass of darkness. Be serious. What's a few inches of meat compared to the immeasurable reaches of the liberated mind? Two thousand five hundred years ago, friends, five hundred BC, a woman Soma apparently left her husband. Right? <laughs> this, what's a few inches of meat compared to the immeasurable reaches of the liberated mind? Right. I'm going to jump over to Gutta, whose name means guardian. This is a. This is one of my personal favorites i'm going to probably say that each time um but this is um this is gutta going forth is no game we leave whole lives behind not just people and possessions all your wants all your fears all the little rituals that get you through the day and tuck you in at night. Only see that all these pretty little wooden pieces aren't you and they don't belong to you. They belong to the game. I know it's comforting to count up all the squares, run your fingers along the edge of the board and plan out all your moves ahead of time. The world beyond the table only seems dark, like empty space. It's okay to be afraid. Uh, profound, folks. Very profound. I'm going to jump over to... Sama, this is Sama, whose name means song. Uh, Sama, I, you should know, um, I, I mentioned, I think there's about 73 of these, but some of them are written or are composed by the same nun, and then some of them are by uh, anonymous. We don't know who wrote them. So Sama has a few. Uh, this is, I believe, her second one in the series. <laughs> After 25 years on the path, I've experienced almost everything except peace. When I was young, my mother told me that I would find true happiness only in marriage. Remembering her words all those years later, something in me began to tremble. I gave myself over to the trembling and it showed me all the pain this little heart has ever known. And how countless lives are searching, and how countless lives of searching had brought me at last to the present moment, which I happily married. <laughs> Can you imagine? We've been living together ever since without a single argument. <laughs> oh my gosh i <laughs> okay i'm gonna this okay so let's get back to this light um yeah so the, i mentioned earlier sukha are my kind of heroine for the the sutra tonight her name means this bright or this luminousness, right? This luminosity, right? And so this is a nun Utara, whose, whose name means crossed over. So uh, Utara, and uh, to, Utara has a few poems as well. And Utara's poem reads thus. I asked Patachara, what is the path? Patachara said, just see all thoughts, words, and actions arising all by themselves, not from some imaginary point within. I only partly understood, but I took a seat. As the sun was setting, 
I saw the endless line of one thing leading into another that had brought me to the cushion that night. As the moon was coming up, I saw the arising and the passing away of all things in every direction. As dawn was breaking, wisdom rose in the east and set fire to the long, dark night. But don't take my word for it. Set fire to the darkness within. I promise, it's like nothing you've ever seen. Everybody having a good time? <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> oh, good. Um, okay, cool. So I'm going to jump over to... Oh, this is um, a good one. They're, again, all amazing. Um, this is Utama. Utama uh, means uh, like a great mother, I think. Yeah, great, or great woman. Great woman. Utama. Mm. The entire path and all you will ever need to walk it, you will find inside. So the Buddha taught me. Once I took a closer look, all the running around started to seem a little silly. Things changed so quickly. By the time I got anywhere, I'd be someone else. You are your mother. You are your daughter. One moment gives birth to the next. What we do is who we become. Yeah. For, so for anybody who thought the whole, like, you live and die with each breath and you're reincarnated with each breath, if anybody thought that was like a Mahayana idea, no, I'm sorry. Utama, Utama told us a long time ago, you are your mother. You are your daughter. One moment gives birth to the next. What we do is who we become. That's... I'm going to jump over to Mitakali friend of the dark or friend of darkness in a way. And, you know, I, I did choose a few of these to try to get a theme going with this uh, Saka brightness. So this one's going to kind of touch on that, this friend of the dark. I was always smart. If the path was good, I figured it would make me even smarter. One night while meditating, I watched my thoughts piling themselves up all around me. My mind built a house out of all of those thoughts and then filled that house. Soon it was a whole city, a whole world. Oh, my beautiful, beautiful thoughts. Who will look after you? When I'm gone, I swear I could weep. I could weep for all of you. My sisters, do you really want to be free? Are you ready to leave behind all your precious little houses and make your home everywhere? It's not as hard as you might think. First stand up and walk out the door. Uh, okay, so I'm going to do two now in a row. Um, one nun who got named Sangha, or maybe this was a poem of the Sangha. I'm not exactly sure about that. And then the next one will be the, the, the nun who was named Dhamma, named Dharma, or maybe this is Dharma. N you know, hold on to that. But um, let's see. Actually, we'll do Dharma first. This one's really intense. It took me a while um, to really 
understand how profound it was. Um, so this is Dharma. Another day walking in circles with an empty bowl, leaning on my staff in the middle of the road, my whole body shaking with hunger. What little strength I had left, left me. As I was falling to the ground, I saw I was the spoonful of rice and this whole world the bowl. You can't fail even if you try. I'm going to do that one again. I just want to really paint this picture, right? Like a lot of, a lot of these poems, of course, have been about this idea of like renouncing the path, i.e. being Buddhist, walking the path, the eightfold path and all of that. And so this is this really wild poem about basically going out to beg for your daily food and coming up empty. Rough rough right to be a, a beggar and go out and then to come up empty and so another day walking in circles with an empty bowl leaning on my staff in the middle of the road my whole body shaking with hunger what little strength i had left me and i was uh, as i was falling to the ground i saw I saw that I was the spoonful of rice and this whole world, the bowl. You can't fail even if you try. Uh, I thought about that one a lot. You know, it was this idea that she's, you know, she's come up empty, right? So she, she failed, she failed at the begging or at least she thinks in the beginning, right? Beautiful. Next, Sangha, and if if the nun was named Sangha and she was and and she recited this poem, then she was properly named in that regard. Um, when I left the only home I had ever known, I thought I had left everything behind, but I was still carrying all the years of running back and forth and around in circles after this chasing that just sitting still those circles have broken apart and been carried away by this simple wind blowing in and out hmm. oh there is more I, that's weird so let me do it justice just sitting still those circles have broken apart and been carried away by this simple wind blowing in and out. All your old thoughts, like snow falling on warm ground, just sit back and watch. <laughs> I, I have to be honest, uh, everybody, I have not ever seen such beautiful poetry in buddhism <laughs> like like these sutras are amazing and the and the dharma and all that is amazing but these deeply personal tales these deeply personal stories and realizations I'm in the zen tradition a little bit you know thou, a thousand years later in the zen tradition i i see a little bit of this um you know real humanity um, but this is, these are very special, unique poems, and it's why I, you know, want to spend the night on them. Everybody doing good? Yeah? Questions, answers, ideas? Uh, Michael, what's the original language of these poems? Holly. Holly, okay. Yep. Okay. These are, these are right up there with any... You know, and actually, I've been trying to really look into this. I, I'm not a. Everybody knows that I have my, my thing about originitis, and the the problem, the disease of wanting the first or having to have the first. So, please bear with me. 
I've been trying to find out like if this is accurate, but a few of these translations claim that these are the oldest writings of women, period. Not in East, not in Asia, not in Buddhism, not here, not there, but like period. <laughs> You know, I know that there's Greek uh, poems that go very far back and I've been trying to do my research on maybe, you know, but again, that's where as soon as I care, like who was older, I'm like, all right, buddy, like that's not what we're really interested in. But I do want everybody to know that within the world of Buddhism, these are some of the oldest things you'll find. They're very, very old texts in that way. So. Any other questions, ideas, or comments before I keep keep on singing? Do you want to um about the the um <laughs> the difference at all between the um, translations um, mm. in Matty One Card's book and translation in terms of coming from the Pali? Yeah. So I was, I, I, you know, thanks, Love. I was going to mention that at some point. Um, so I'm, I've, I've held up this version, which is this heart, like fancy Harvard university press bilingual, you know, this is a pretty, I got this one because it, you know, it's a nice study edition. I do want you to know though, that these, the poems in this version at times diverge quite a lot from the ones in this. So this one, Harvard university you know very you know uh, exact translation of what the poly says in that when that way this translator worked with a bunch of nuns from the uh um i believe the aloka vihara nuns and really worked with them to like get at as i understand it from reading the preface you know a lot of the the language in this is uh, euphemistic you know, and so it's talking about things in certain ways. You really need to know uh, other literature at the time, other poetry at the time to get at the deeper meaning. And so I did want to mention that these, if you ever were to compare them, at times they're quite different, but I do believe this one is getting more at the, truly the heart of the message um, in that regard. So, mm hmm Michael, Yo. Um, this might be uh, too thick or too too much to to look at, but uh, it's just it's there's been this referencing I think in two at least two of them that I was I was hearing about looking inside for the light, looking inside for it it you know, and uh, for some reason I, I maybe I'm just a little off tonight, but you know I. I didn't. I didn't see what we've studied in the past as that as looking there for, mm. uh, for enlightenment and or, uh, it. Got it. Gotcha. Yeah. I mean, I I, I set us up, Saka, <laughs> this idea of the bright, and so I I owe you a good answer on that. I hear you on like, you know, maybe you're thinking about a certain uh, dualisticness, inside outsideness that sort of maybe is ringing in that, um, or just this sort of like kind of maybe even Christian language of light in general or something to that effect. But so I hear you on that. And so I want to just point out. So the, I, there, there is a very a good way to point at Saka, to point at this light that we're talking about. And the way that I like to point at it, and Matt, you've probably heard this before, but I'll tell it again. The idea is, is that like, I'm in, I'm in my little uh, Dharma playhouse here and the source, the source of illumination are these lights that I have, right? So that's what's illuminating this situation here. Um, since we're just past the summer solstice, I can see if I go outside, the source of illumination would be the sun. It's what allows me to see the, the beautiful bay I live nearby, the lights here would allow me to see the beautiful you and the beautiful people, right? 
the question becomes when you are in a dream next to the bay or reading a book, what is the source of illumination? It's a simple question, it really. I mean, what is illuminating your dream book in your dreamscape? And that and and there's that illumination indeed illumination that is illuminating your dream is not the terrestrial sun and is not compact fluorescent light bulbs it is the mind for lack of a better term and that analogy that i just gave you of like oh wow my mind is illuminating my whole <laughs> that is the light that they're sort of talking about or at least pointing at and it is the light of consciousness, the light of a lot of things. And it's uh, worth thinking about <laughs> in that way. And so, yeah, you know, I've, I've ton of few sutras that get more into this language of light. Um, but I guess what I would like to just finish this answer with is that this whole discourse on an internal illumination, which is the light of consciousness, very, very old in that way. Yeah, not a Mahayana thing. Righteous. Anything else before I start crying? Okay. Um, okay, now, yeah, then I'm not going to cry just yet. There's one that I might cry. It's too heavy, but I'm going to actually do... Suba. This is good. Yeah, this is a good one for right now. So Suba, I don't know what her name means. I didn't really look up Suba, but she is the goldsmith's daughter. <laughs> so Suba, the goldsmith's daughter. And this one is really great. Let me make sure. Yep. This one's really great. This is particularly great if you were here last Sunday for Dharma Doors when I did the Surata Sutra, which is all about kind of wealth and poverty and this kind of the flipping of the idea of what is wealth and what is poverty, right? So this is, a, and that's, that was a, a Mahayana Sutra that we did last week. This is a beautiful um, kind of ties in perfectly with that one. Uh, again, this is Suba, uh, the goldsmith's daughter. They all told me the same thing. There's only one way to be truly safe. Get as much as you can and hold on tight. We don't take greed seriously enough. I grew up in a house made of gold, so I ought to know. You see what it does to people, slowly, over time. It changes them, takes them over. You find yourself saying, I'll learn to be generous. I'll give it all away. Uh, but first, I just need a little bit more. Stop lying to yourself. See a clenched fist for what it is. Not tomorrow, not in 20 years, now. I am Suba, the goldsmith's daughter, eating whatever is offered, sleeping wherever I can find. This is what freedom looks like, not a bucket of coins buried in the backyard. So that's a lovely one. I think I'll, fo I'll follow that one up with, she's not, she's not on the board. I wasn't sure I was going to get to her, but I'm, this is going great. And so this is a nun. She's hiding off in squirrel sanctuary somewhere with the squirrels. So this is, uh, uh, let me get the page 27. Yeah. So this is a, the poem is actually called Ada Kasi, the wealth of Kasi and Kasi is our nun. A night with me used to cost more than all the land in Kasi. But through all the pricing and haggling, I somehow lost interest in being talked about like a field of wheat. Unlike any crop, 
I have ripened here in the shade of these gentle trees. A field for no farmer, a land that is paid for itself. Um, and, by, and by the way, there's a number of these, like I mentioned, that's like, of course, are none here, who is, I guess, from Kasi, not her name Kasi, but from Kasi, clearly was a prostitute, right? A night with me used to cost more than all the land in Kasi. There's a few of, of these um, uh, where it's uh, prostitutes. Uh, like I said, I suspect that Sukha maybe was a barmaid or something like that. Um, and, and actually there's even uh, all kinds of, basically all walks of life. And I just want to pause briefly on that um, to, to emphasize this. It's important. It's important to say this. Um, you know, Buddhism as a tradition gets um, recognized for being uh, anti-caste and therefore egalitarian. And indeed, it is anti-caste and it is indeed very egalitarian. And that egalitarianness was from the beginning in terms of the Buddha, Shakyamuni, Siddhartha Gautama, um, um, opening the path or whatever you want to call it and saying, are you a suffering human being? Great, come on in. And so in terms of there being monks and nuns, there were monks and nuns in the lifetime of the Buddha. Many of these may have been during the lifetime of the Buddha. And this sort of, um, um, that even, you know, it's tricky to put it uh, uh, well, but this idea that even a prostitute could get enlightened is at play in here, where that from the Buddhist point of view, that has nothing to do with what we're talking about. <laughs> And indeed, like, you know, this, uh, I forget which one it was, where it was like, as, it has nothing to do with male or female. It has nothing to do with whether I was a prostitute or this. It has nothing to do with these things. So the, the philosophy and the practice and the historical reality kind of often line up in that way. And so these, you know, these songs of freedom, you know, these, uh, the first free women, and a lot of these poems are, are truly songs about freedom it's it's because of this deep egalitarianism in an, in a culture or society where there weren't a lot of other uh, not a lot of other moves you know and so it's i just want to make that that uh, emphasize that point that it's like yes <laughs> buddhism is very egalitarian and these are poems that speak of that right okay actually i'm going to do one more that's sort of fun let me i'll have to find it apologies where'd you go well okay well I can't find the one I want. So we'll get to the earth. This one I found, I find very hard. It's, it's just, it's rough. It's rough. Uh, so this is Ubiri, the earth. Ubiri. How many days and nights did I wander the woods calling your name? Jiva, my daughter, Jiva, my heart. Late one night, finally exhausted, I fell to the ground. Oh, my heart, I heard a voice say. 84,000 daughters, all named Jiva, have died and been buried here in this boundless cemetery that you call a world. For which of these Jivas are you mourning? Lying there on the ground, I shared my grief with all 84,000 mothers, and they shared their grief with me. Somehow I found myself healed, not of grief, 
but of the immeasurable loneliness that attends grief. My sisters, those of you who have known the deepest loss, as you cry out in the wilderness, just make sure you stop every so often to listen for a voice calling back. I cried. I said I was going to cry. I cried. <laughs> so, Ubiri, you know, Ubiri, 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 of course, is a mother who has lost her, her daughter, who has lost her child. You know, and so it's this kind of very powerful uh, movement, of course, where she goes to the cemetery crying, Jiva, my daughter, Jiva, my heart. But then late one night, finally exhausted, I fell to the ground and I heard a voice say, 84,000 daughters, all named Jiva, have died and been buried here in this boundless cemetery that you call the world. For which of these Jivas are you mourning? Lying there on the ground, I shared my grief with those 84,000 mothers. And they shared their grief with me. Okay, how's everybody doing? <laughs> um, cool, so I think since we're going good, I'll take a moment. Something, so like, yeah, hey. Hi, 84,000, uh, that's not a number, that's, that's a number that, that, that's in Buddhism before, right? Yeah. 84,000 Dharma mothers. So how is that related? Um, it's a great, it's a great question. It's a great question. Um, there are a variety of new numerological stuff that I've seen that I've not have neither been convinced by nor impressed by. It does seem to just be the Buddhist way of saying a lot. <laughs> Like a re, re, like a lot in that way. So, yeah. Now, yeah, yeah. I don't want to even dive into any potentials of what it might mean. But so, Michael. Yeah. Hey, Noe. No. Uh, what is that last line? Uh, uh, not the grief, but the, the loneliness. What was that last little line? I'm sorry. It's yeah, yeah, so yeah. beautiful. Um, it's not the. Um, oh, the line, I know, that is the line, right? Oh my gosh. And uh, so lying out there on the ground, I shared my grief with those 84,000 mothers and they shared their grief with me. Somehow I found myself healed, not of grief, but of the immeasurable loneliness that attends grief. My sisters, those of you who have known the deepest loss, as you cry out in the wilderness, just make sure you stop every so often to listen for a voice calling back. <sighs> oh, folks. Okay. Um, so let me real quick, um, let me just because I don't want to not do it, I'm going to jump back to the Samyutta Nikaya and I want to do Sukha's second, the second Sutta. It's really short, but it's just to sort of like, you know, make sure that I, I, I covered it. So this is the second of the actual sutras or suttas about Sukha. And it says, thus, thus have I heard on one occasion. The Blessed One was dwelling in Rajgriha in the bamboo grove, the squirrel sanctuary. Now on that occasion, a certain lay follower gave food to the bhikkhuni Sukha. Then the yaksha, who had full confidence in the bhikkhuni Sukha, went forth street to street and from square to square in Rajgriha. On that occasion, reciting the verses thus, he has engendered much merit 
wise indeed is this lay follower who just gave food to Sukha, one released from all the knots. So that's it. Um, again, it is our Deva, fabulous Deva Yaksha praising Sukha for this person who gave her some food, right? Sukha, one released from all knots. So that's, so I wanted to just uh, touch on these two phrases, one being released from all knots. And the second one, which is from her first sutta, that Sukha teaches the deathless state, but nobody's listening. So the, you know, this being released from all the knots is like, it's a, it's a great phrase in Buddhism and it speaks about this freedom of renunciation, the freedom of going forth. You know, I don't know, you know, if you got bills, you got a mortgage, you got a this, you got a that, you got car payments, you got this. Those are all knots. Those are all the entanglements of the world. <laughs> and the idea is, of course, is that that's part of being in the world is being all bound up and knotted up in it. And the freedom of going forth, of renouncing in this Buddhist tradition is being freed from all of that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so that's this idea of being released or freed from all the knots. But then this idea of like, what has happened to these people of Rajgriha? They sleep as if they've been drinking mead. Why don't they attend on Sakha as she teaches the deathless state? And that's a, that's a phrase. Um, the deathless state is a, is a phrase, you see it much more, of course, in the Pali suttas, the older stuff, but it is, I mean, basically it's a, it's a, a way of saying the Dharma, a way of saying the teachings about Nirvana, about release and all of that. But the, just one note about it, why I wanted to stop on it. it. It's very significant to this idea of what these women are involved in. What is this Dharma? What is this practice? And I think it's interesting to reflect on this idea of the deathless state. Buddhism in no way teaches or cares about immortality. <laughs> that would be ridiculous. <laughs> that would be about this body and about trying to preserve it in some way and keep it going. And like, oh yeah, like if I, if I could only live forever, right? B Buddhism teaches the deathless the deathless so not about immor not immortality De totally outside of birth and death totally outside of that paradigm that's freedom the deathless and that's again that's just that that um well again that that to teach the deathless state is to teach the dharma to teach all of these ideas about not identifying with the dying body and I straight away, actually, because these are fairies, they're elders of, the, of that tradition, some of these get, you know, pretty dark when it comes to the body. <laughs> and, and, you know, pretty dark in terms of, like, that level of, like, looking at the body as, like, you know, a cor as a walking corpse kind of stuff. It's very Theravada. I kind of avoided some of that. I just want you to know that that's in there. Um, but that idea, again, of just reaching this liberated state where it's not even about birth and death in that sense, right? And then the other thing that I just wanted to say, which is that the second stanza of that first poem I read, or first sutta of hers that I read, which is, so she's out there teaching the deathless state, but everybody's, it's like they're drunk. They don't even hear her, right? But the wise, drink it up. Her words, that is, her teachings on the deathless, the wise, drink it up. That dharma, irresistible, ambrosial, nutritious, as travelers do to a cloud. The reason why I mention this is that if you get, if you study with me or you get into Mahayana Sutras, 
there is a lot of cloud metaphor in Mahayana sutras. And it even, it took me a, a, a while, a very long while to understand what that analogy was. You, you know, you, you study Dharma, you read a lot and you know, like, oh, okay, clouds are, it's sort of about their um, morphingness, their movability. They're kind of like, okay, that's cool. But that can't be it. That can be the only thing, right? And so you start to, you know, you keep little notes about clouds in, in the Dharma. And then you come across a poem like this and you're like, oh, oh. I mean, indeed, given, given that the Samyutta Nikaya is like some really old sutras, this could be the origin of the cloud metaphor to begin with. Sukha. And if it's not the origin of it, it's a very, very early rendition of the cloud metaphor, which is that she's out there teaching. Well, she's teaching the deathless state, but she's out there teaching um, Oh, how can I put it? Oh, it's right there. Oh, and she's a barmaid. She's te she, like this idea, you know, the idea of dukkha or suffering, of course, is this idea that this world will never be satisfying. This, this world and the things of it and the delights of it and the joys of it, they will never fully slake that thirst. But the Dharma, the, that, what does it say? It's, it, oh, it doesn't say, yeah, it says irresistible. But that idea of like that the Dharma is quenching. If you understand what I just said about the analogy that the things of this world will never be satisfying, they will never quench your thirst. But the Dharma is quenching like a cloud to travelers. So that's in there, all kinds of beautiful. I mean, even just any one of the poems I read, we could have unpacked all night you know, line by line, so many subtleties, but I just want to, you know, have a, have a nice, uh, uh, a nice poem filled night though. So how's there any questions, ideas, comments, answers? I want to find the one I'm going to try to, I really want to find my, the, the one. Well, actually, um, So I'm going to read, I want to, I was thinking about reading this one. So I'll read this one. This one's called uh, Mita. I'm back to the actual book of poems, by the way. This is called Mita, which means friend. Full of trust, you left home and soon learned to walk the path making yourself a friend to everyone and making everyone a friend. When the whole world is your friend, fear will find no place to call home. And when you make the mind your friend, you'll know what trust really means. Listen, I have followed this path of friendship to its end and I can say with absolute certainty, it will lead you home. Hmm. Oh, also this one, also Bhadra. So this is a nun, uh, Bhadra, lucky. You always considered yourself lucky because things seem to work out the way that you wanted. Now luck has a different meaning. Lucky to be walking a path that finds peace in the arising and passing away of each present moment, regardless of how things work out or don't. <laughs> Uh, 
I I personally think that's a beautiful Buddhist poem about <laughs> the idea of luck. <laughs> Frankly, this idea, right? <laughs> like, uh, take a take a moment to reflect on that idea of lucky, right? Versus this idea of the wisdom of regardless of how things work out or don't, right? <laughs> Okay, I got to find the one that I want. It's so funny. Mm -hmm. If there's any questions, please jump in while I try to find this real quick. And then I'll have a few last remarks to say. Okay. Mm hmm I found it. Oh, I did, I'm so glad I found it too. This this is another another key one. So interestingly, and uh, uh, folks that have been coming to Darmendors lately will find this very interesting. This is the nun named Vimala. Vimala, which you know, uh, getting this book, it's and then learning about these nuns, it's like oh oh oh, so. Vimala, right? Um, uh, stainless, I believe. Flawless. That's the idea of Vimala. Virgin is also the meaning of Vimala. Virgin. Interesting. Um, it, well, interesting. Interesting. But particularly interesting in light of her poem. So this is the poem, the Gotha. Vimala. My mother taught me how to sell my youth for money and some sense of power, just as her mother had taught her. At our front door, I answered the calls of passing men with well rehearsed lines, laughing and lightly running a finger along my neck and breasts. A hunter with a baited trap. Now I spend my days sitting at the foot of this tree, wearing only a shaved head and a double robe. The legs of this naked mind spread wide open, ready to welcome whatever comes. <laughs> um, by the way, that's, that's one that doesn't re read quite like that in the in this scholarly translation <laughs> um all right folks i i really i feel like i could just read these and read these all night um uh, uh yeah i'm um but i think i will um any any questions, comments before I kind of make some concluding remarks? Sort of, I'm not concluding, but I'm gonna like. I do want to mention these eight heavenly beings just because it's relevant to this yaksha and sort of this world we're in. Um, in my opinion, these are all heavenly beings in that sense, right? So, um, just to give a little context to this, in many many sutras, you will have heard this list that, and it's not Mahayana sutras at all, all throughout here, that in attendance at the, the Buddha teaching the sutra at the Dharma lesson, there were Devas, Nagas, Yakshas, Gandharavas, Asuras, Garudas, Kimnaras, and Maharagas. It's the same list in all the sutras, and these are the eight non-human beings they're usually called eight heavenly beings uh these are usually all considered very good rebirths if if you want to think of them that way um i've mentioned the third one already this is the yaksha yakshas are nature spirits usually trees and that's where it appears in this and like i said this was a female yaksha named Devata, or maybe, or maybe in the poem, they were referring to this yaksha 
as a deva, a devatta. So it's not sure if that's the yaksha's name or if it is this first class of heavenly being. This is just your general class of deity. Um, you know, of course, in the, in the Indian Hindu Buddhist tradition, there are many, many uh, realms besides this one. And devas or deities or these heavenly beings inhabit many of them, if not all of them. And by the way, devas, of course, come in male and female. Nagas, these are our shape-shifting serpent beings, dragons sometimes translated as. They live in the water, and they actually have, they're like basically waterbenders, if you're, if you're into that kind of thing. And so they have a kind of power or control over water. Those are the nagas. Yakshas, again, usually trees, nature spirits. They're, they're always sort of nature spirits might be a rock, something like that, but trees are the normal. Gandharavas are these incense eaters, right? And Gandharavas are, are heavenly musicians. In, within a certain Buddhist religious context, when you burn incense, it's kind of for the Gandharavas because they eat, they eat incense. Asuras are these demigods, titans, um, very powerful beings, but plagued with anger. So they're kind of, they're a tricky one that way. Garudas are these giant guardian birds. And my, this will be my second uh, Lord of the Rings reference, but if you, you know the big eagles in Lord of the Rings, well, the Garudas seem a lot like that. Giant, giant prehistoric birds from out of nowhere that will come and save you if need be. Kinaras, Kinaras are half, half bird, half human. So kind of like a centaur, but not horse man, bird human. Also musicians, I believe they're kind of percussionists. And then finally, the eighth non-human being, these Mahoragas. Interestingly, Mahoragas, they live underground and are the cause of earthquakes. So. Those are the eight heavenly beings. And since I took the time to write them on the board, I wanted to uh, share them with you a little bit. Questions, comments, answers, ideas about the eight non-human beings. I see some activity, but everything seems good there. Everybody good? Cool. What do you wanna talk about? You wanna read more poems? You know, I will I will share this with you really quickly, just just for 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 fun. Um, I'm I've uh, been teaching now for about twenty years, and uh, the first class that I ever taught was at the University of Hawaii. I was a graduate student. And um, just the sort of luck of the draw, if you want to say that, I mean, I think it had to do with my interest and my background, but the very first class I ever taught was a course in women and religion. And I was kind of given that course because I had a background in uh, what would be called feminist philosophy or queer philosophy. And so Prior to studying religion, I was actually majoring in philosophy and did all this kind of work in, in, like I said, feminist philosophy and queer philosophy. And so when I shifted my major to religion, then went to graduate school, and then they were going to give me a class to teach, maybe it was based on that background or I don't, I don't know. I don't know why, again, but I was, that was my ticket. Hey, buddy, you have to teach this uh, women in religion class. And so it was a beautiful experience, survey course, of course. It was like basically, you know, a couple of weeks on Islam, a couple of weeks on Christianity, a couple of weeks on Buddhism, a couple of weeks on this, and just sort of looking at the role of women in those religions and kind of talking about it. Beautiful experience, a seminar, you know, about 15, all women, very um, um, intimidating experience for a young a young man to be the teacher in a women in religion in a, a room full of women, right? Talk about feeling 
out of place. <laughs> Talk about feeling like you should be sitting down in that way. Um, and so the reason why I, I kind of share this anecdotal story with you about my background is that a night like tonight is very dear to my heart. It's very dear to what I'm interested in, what I think is important. And I have another book here I just wanted to share, share with you really quickly. Um, uh, but before I do, when I was at the University of, of Hawaii, doing my master's degree in Buddhist studies, there was also a nun, a, a nun from Taiwan in the program. Uh, her name was uh, Tsukai. Sure, Tsukai. And me and Tsukai, we, we became friends, just, you know, graduate pals. Um, I, it was one of those things where, um, where basically it was a moment where my study of this thing called Buddhism and Buddhism met. You know, because I was, I met, I had met her like a real Buddhist, like she was a nun. And I mean, she's doing a master's degree at the University of Hawaii and all that, but she was like full on robe, shaved head, been, had, had been ordained for many years. And I, um, I, I, I don't want to make it sound like I revered her. I did, not, I did not revere her, but I deeply, deeply respected her. And it, and, and, it, it was my relationship with her, or I don't want to make it sound like a relationship, but it was my friendship with her that I, I really like came to a really deep respect for what it means to renounce in the modern world. Because again, this was a, a woman doing a, a master's degree at the University of Hawaii. She was not uh, Ubiri under a tree in Squirrel Sanctuary. She was very much in the world, in the modern world, you know, toting her laptop around the campus and all of that. And, and um, uh, Tsukai, she was the, she was the one that made the, uh, she made a funny joke uh, once to me about a gold card because she had a credit card and it was about touching gold and silver. And she made a funny joke about the gold card. And so she was just really funny, you know, very aware of those, you know, if you were for, uh, there for my talk on Friday night, I talked a lot about the, paradoxes of being a buddhist monastic where you're not supposed to touch gold or silver which is basically money and so to be a monastic in the modern world is a little tricky and like is, is a credit card money things like that and so um talking with sukai and just getting to know her it it again it just was like uh an, a great experience for me to really learn something about buddhism uh, not just what i was learning in the classroom and I was so um, kind of moved by her that, so there's, I was going to show you this book. This is a book called The Lives of the Nuns. These are wonderful biographies of Chinese Buddhist nuns. Um, and they're not poems. They're biographies sort of about like what their home life was like, why they left home, um, various like things. And the I, I guess I just to, to finish this story off, I got really into these um, these um, well, they're they're old fourth, fifth, sixth century biographies of these nuns, and it was when I was first studying Chinese and learning classical Chinese, and I was so struck when I got to know Tsukai and I, and I, and I found out more about why she renounced, I found out more about her, the expectations of her home and how, how the monastery was this like plan B, like there was this whole world set up for her, but then she kind of found this escape route and all this stuff. And when I heard her story and this is like, you know, what is this 2000, 1999, 2000 that I'm hearing her tell me about this. And I'm reading these fourth, fifth century biographies of nuns. And it's like the same exact story, like almost exactly. And in fact, for a class, and I can't even imagine what class this was for, I wound up doing this thing where I wrote, I wrote Sukai's biography in classical Chinese in the format <laughs> as if she was one of these fourth, fifth century nuns. Like, and again, I don't know what class would have accepted that as credit, but um, 
I, I wanted to do it as like this kind of expressive piece in that way to really show how, how timeless her experience seemed, even though again, she had a laptop and a credit card and all of that, but that her, her, yeah, her, her renouncing, her renunciation, you know, that there's something timeless in that. And I definitely think, you know, I encourage everybody, if you liked the poems tonight, to pick this up because these ring, you know, they ring so uh, modern, contemporary, or whatever you want to call it. They could have been written yesterday, and especially um, stylistically. You know, stylistically, this is like, um, yeah. Okay, folks, so I've gone on and on. I appreciate you listening to that all of this questions comments or ideas on nuns renunciation i have a question about the context in which these poems were written was mm. it that were the nuns writing them for each other or were they writing them for people um lay people um what was the kind of context around that it's a great question i don't think we know that exactly um Yeah, my, my gut tells me that it was sort of about passing on the knowledge to the next generation, that these were written for incoming nuns in a way. That would be my gut, just because of knowing the way other things circulated, you know, these were not for public consumption that way. You know, you take like a... Um, I, I kind of reference quickly the Zen Buddhist tradition has similar uh, poetry, very personal poetry, male and female, very personal Buddhist inspired poetry. Um, but interestingly, that poetry was very much for the public, for public consumption and almost in a way as an upaya to get people to come and renounce and like come join the monastery. These I don't think would have circulated like that is my guess. And I think that, and, and I'm guessing this, this is educated guess, because a few of them do seem to be about passing them to the next sister in line in a way. So that's my guess. But, um, but yeah, but you know, like a lot of this stuff, um, um, I forget what ex how this actually comes to us, probably from Thailand you know, you know, not from Pali, it's going to be translated uh, from a different language back into Pali than into English and all this stuff. So the actual origins of these poems, I'm not 100% on. So. Any other? Um, and of course, any, any questions regarding um, like none nun nunism nun you know being a nun not that i am one of course and not that i'm in many way a renunciant uh but like i've said with everybody in the past what i was studying at at the university of hawaii was the monastic rules that was what my thesis was in and so this idea of renouncing becoming a nun if you have any questions about like about that i i can provide information in that sense Especially if there's any questions about male female differences, that type of stuff. Michael, it's Noe. Hey, Noe. Um, what's lovely about these poems and, and the reading of them and the and the, the wisdom within them, and it's it makes me think of the Bodhisattva path for some reason and 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 the, so this is earlier and then later the bodhisattva path and and the renunciation not a physical monastic renunciation but a a a, a way of getting there and yet staying and giving it away these these beautiful poems so i'm i'm just weighing the 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 two <laughs> they're <Yep>. the same <laughs> no and i mean and i appreciate you bringing that up um, you know, on, on Sunday nights, we spend a lot of time talking about the Bodhisattva path and a lot of the sutras that we deal with, deal with that. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, I already I mentioned it a few times, you know, that that you might think some of this was from much later than it was in that way, right? And, you know, an idea that I've I've danced around or or hinted at, you know, is this idea that that the what we call the Bodhisattva path, which is this deeply compassionate path, um, you know that there's a way that that's always been the path and that it might have gotten lost <laughs> and then and then recovered and then that's the the mahayana bodhisattva oh like but i'm always of the feeling that none of this is new none of the mahayana is new none of the bodhisattva is new it's a little different though i will say that because so in addition to all of the poems I didn't read that were a little more down on the body, you know? So anyway, I didn't want to go there, right? So I didn't go there. Another place that I didn't go is that a lot of these poems are very much um, trying to get you, the reader, to renounce. It like And like, you know, bick it. <laughs> you know, shave the head and join a monastery. And, you know... I've often said too in my Dharma talks, you know, and, and, and I have sort of alluded to it tonight, my deep respect for this nun that I, I got to meet. Um, I have such profound respect for people who have renounced. I, I, it's like, it's so profound of a move. Like I, I really, I, I, I often want to spend extra time <laughs> lauding lauding the the renunciatory path because it's so serious it's so serious but not just for for the person to do that it's serious for the world it's like a it's a really bold courageous move <laughs> you know like we we you know this idea of like you know, putting your money where your mouth is or walking the walk, you know, or whatever. It's like, that's walking the walk. I mean, you want to talk about the path? That's walking the walk. That's putting your money where your mouth is. Like, that's really doing it. And I don't ever want to say that a householder or a lay Buddhist is not doing it. That's not at all. I never, ever say that. And I often say that the Bodhisattva moves harder. <laughs> it's harder <laughs> if you're really a Bodhisattva. Like if you're really actually a bodhisattva out in the world, then that's way crazier. That's way crazier than, than living in squirrel sanctuary under a tree. Maybe, maybe not. But so again, I just want to um, say that ab about Noe's question, bodhisattva path, that I think these are bodhisattvas, <laughs> first of all. Um, and, or however, the this beautiful bodhisattva path that we usually talk about on sunday nights is not this renunciatory path it is a special in that way so thanks noe any other questions comments answers ideas Okay. Um, well, then on that note, I will conclude it um, by letting you know that I'm going to, I'm not 100% sure on where we're going from here, but I do think, I do think I'm going to jump back into the, the heap of jewels. I know that a, a lot of folks that have been um, getting on board with the Dharma doors uh, have gone out and bought this and kind of been getting into it. I'm into it. Um, and so I think we're going to do at least one more sutra in here, if not many. Um, so stay tuned for that next week. Again, I don't know exactly which one I want to do. I need to, um, well, I got to think about it. Um, but just stay tuned for that. So we're going to jump back into the heap of jewels. And again, who knows where that's going to go. Um, I want to thank you all for being here, for listening. Um, and... Have a great night. Thank you, Michael. And uh, thank you, Colin.
for Holland, Holland, Holland. Thank you, Holland, for sharing your birthday with us, and <laughs> thank you both for this really beautiful uh, collaborative um, evening <laughs> that we just spent together. This was really lovely, and. Um, we have a couple of announcements from the collective, but before we do that, uh, some of you may know Jazzwall, and Jazzwall has something exciting to share with us. So Jazzwall. Hey, thanks, Katie. Can you hear me? Uh, awesome. Hey, everyone. So um, last year, I uh, recorded my first episode for my first podcast ever. Uh, I was an interview with Michael Owens, and uh, it's just quite a journey. It's like a hour and a half interview that I've split into two episodes. And so I just published the first episode of this thing and love for you to check it out. Uh, Michael's just a rock star. So it's so good <laughs> listening to him. <laughs> um, so the, my podcast is called clear on life and uh, it's um, yeah. Podcast.clearonlife.com. Thank you, Katie. You got it. And uh, the first episode is up. You can find it on Apple and Spotify, you, like wherever you look for podcasts, or you could just directly play it from the website, that link that Katie shared. Awesome. Thank you so much. And the, the very first episode with MC Owens was recorded in the Dharma Collective. That's um, right. So connections all <laughs> over the place. Uh, totally. So check that out and enjoy it. There is no such thing as too much MC Owens. Um, and so <laughs> check out the podcast and We'll see you all back here uh, next Sunday. And in the meantime, um, if you were paying attention to the poem uh, by the Goldsmith's Daughter and you are feeling that unclenchedness around money, um, we always welcome Donna. Uh, we pass most of the Donna that we receive at the collective through to our teachers at this point. And we divert some into the collective to continue maintaining this central space where we can all gather. Um, so if you're uh, wanting to uh, share resources of the collective, please do. There are some links in the chat. And we'll see you all back here next Sunday. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Michael. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Michael. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. And way to go.